Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, heavenly King. Comfort the spirit of truth, who are everywhere. Present if you will, soul things, treasure your blessings, and gear of life. Come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Son, and Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us, and save us. Amen. Good evening to everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll continue where we stopped the last time. If someone else wants to join us, is welcome to do so. Uh, just log in. Uh, I don't know, usually on, on Tuesday, we don't have an issue with, with logging in. Usually it's on Wednesday, I don't know why. However, we will uh, continue. The last time we entered uh, into the new chapter of the Catechism, which is trying, we're following this book. Uh, it's called Worship. For the Thomas Hopko, the second volume, an elementary handbook on the Orthodox Church, where we covered for the past few months, we covered the main holidays, the main feasts in the Orthodox Church. Today, we're going to uh, talk about the Divine Liturgy. Last Tuesday, we talked about, in general, uh, what is the Divine Liturgy? What is the meaning of the Eucharist? What is the meaning of what is the place of the divine liturgy in the Orthodox uh, Church? And we said that the divine liturgy is the Orthodox Church. Uh, without it, without the Holy Eucharist, there is no church. Uh, Christ himself constitutes the Eucharist on Good uh, Thursday uh, before he gets betrayed and later on crucified on the cross, dying on the cross. And he leaves us the uh, body and blood of his body and blood in the form of wine and bread that in water that will be um, transfigured, if you will, through the blessing of the Holy Spirit to become the body and blood of Christ. And we do this in his honor, which we call the anamnesis of the church and the epiclesis, invoking the Holy Spirit to descend and consecrate the gifts so they can become his true body and blood. And we partake thereof uh, so that uh, we can become one with Christ. So this is something that, of course, we're going to come back to this team to talk about it. Why is that? Uh, why is so important and so forth? However, Today, we want to talk a little bit more about the practical aspect of the divine liturgy. We want to talk and cover the, uh, the very basics, uh, which is uh, what happens before a priest comes and a deacon, if he serves with him, when he wants to uh, serve the divine liturgy. So let me share first one screen with you, and then we'll move to the, uh, to the slides. But first, let's go with uh, this screen. Uh, this is, as you know, the, the word is prothesis uh, in Greek, uh, which means the, the offering. And so uh, before the actual beginning of the divine liturgy, the priest enters the church with special uh, prayers. And here are the, some of the photos. We'll zoom in, but uh, we, I have already prepared for you something that will uh, help you to understand even uh, more. Uh, this is something that, uh, just for your information, to know that um, when we serve, let's say today we serve the liturgy, uh, right before... Uh, we start with the Orthodox, which is the preparational service before the Divine Liturgy. Uh, the priest comes into the temple and he starts to do the, what we call the proskomedi, or the service of the, of the preparation, the oblation, where we, when the priest takes the specially prepared bread, it's called prosphora, or offering, uh, along with wine and, and the water, he uh, ser says certain prayers, and then he prepares that so that later, during the Divine Liturgy, uh, it will be consecrated to become the body and blood of Christ. So we today we're going to talk about what the priest does on a practical level with the with all that is going on. So uh, just uh, turn off some of the uh, things here, and that's why we are going to um, cover uh, the, uh, the the basics. So let's share the screen with our uh, slides on. So you can uh, all see. So if we follow uh, the book uh, of Father Thomas Hopko, we will try to uh, cover the. Uh, we will try to cover uh, the the entrance of the priest into the temple and what happens. Uh, what kind of prayers does he say and so forth? So. The prothesis, or we're going to call it also the service of the proskomedi, is the preparation of the bread and the wine uh, for the divine uh, liturgy. Uh, let me just 
mute some of the some of the here. Okay. So we'll go like this. On the left side, you see the icon uh, offering the consecrated bread, his body to the disciples. Uh, he is being accompanied, of course, by the apostles and above them by, by angels. On the right side, we called the, the great humility of Christ. This is the third Pacos, holy him uh, after he was descended from the cross. And uh, we are actually going to cover this now. So before the actual beginning of the divine liturgy, the priest enters the church with special prayers and puts on his liturgical vestment. So in order for this to happen, we, uh, we, are, we have these pictures for you so you can have more visual understanding of what, what's going on. So let's say if the liturgy starts at 10 o'clock, like we usually do on Sunday here, or 9 o'clock, like today when we serve, uh, the priest will come approximately an hour prior to that. So what he, what he does before everybody comes, he goes into the temple, and he comes into, of course, he venerates the icon. He comes in front of the iconostas. This is the, uh, uh, the, the divide between the, the, what we call the nows, where the people stand, and the Holy of Holies, where you can see the curtain here. And he starts to say certain prayers in order to, uh, what we call also, take the time to consecrate the time for him to get ready to prepare for uh, serving the divine liturgy. However, this preparation is the, what we call the official part, but the priest himself, like any other Orthodox Christians, before he even considers of partaking of the, uh, of the body and blood of Christ, receiving the Holy Communion, or even more to serve the divine liturgy, that requires other preparation. So usually every priest before today, they have to do their own prayer rule, private prayer rule. They also they read the canon of the Eucharist for the preparational uh, uh, prayers for before taking the Holy Communion, like any Orthodox Christian should do, one at least one of those two things as part of their private prayer rule so that we can prepare for the Holy Communion. The other way we prepare, of course, is through fasting. So even in days when we don't fast, like let's say between Pascha and the, the whole bride week, and we still serve the divine liturgy, that time that we usually stop eating, let's say approximately let's say after eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the evening, up until the next day, uh, as you know, in the Orthodox Church, we don't drink coffee, we don't eat breakfast before we go to liturgy, because we, the first thing we want to taste, the first thing we want to put into our mouth is Christ himself. That's why this time of, let's say, six to eight hours is being taken as a, as a fasting period of time. Usually that time we spend sleeping, but when we wake up, when we get ready to go to church, we don't eat, we don't drink water even, and so forth. That can be, uh, uh, there can be exception for that in, in, in case people are, let's say, ill, too old, or little children who have to take certain types of food because of taking medication and so forth. But that all can be, uh, let's say, done with the blessing of, the, of their parish priest who has the responsibility to do. So anyway, here is the priest. He is in the middle of the, of the temple in front of the iconostas, in front of him, is the altar on the right side is the icon of Christ, and the left side is the icon of the third of course. And what he does, uh, he's what we call taking the time, the keros. So usually we have only one priest here, but usually when the liturgy is served with the deacon, the deacon would say, Bless Master, because the priest is the right hand of the bishop. So he refers to him like he is the bishop. Of course, the, the priest is not a bishop, but the priest says the regular. Uh, exclamation, which is, blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Uh, the deacon says, Amen. He, and they start the, uh, uh, the to all of us known prayer. So, heavenly king, the comfort, the spirit of truth, who had every and full soul thing, treasure of bliss, secure of love, common abundance, and cleanses from every impurity, and save us also good one. And the deacon continues, or the priest by himself says this verse, God, holy, mighty, holy, mother, have mercy on us. But the, the prayer that is called the Trisagion, he says, the most holy trinity, and of course, our father, uh, here, uh, just uh, forgive me for this, my, my father was deleted from here, but that's uh, my mistake. However, right after the Holy Trinity prayer, he says, uh, glory to the Father and to the Son, Holy Spirit. He says, our Father who art in heaven, and then for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and even to the ages of ages, Son. So the priest here, 
uh, says these prayers. Right afterwards, he continues what we call the taking of the time. These are the following prayers. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us for laying aside all excuse for sinners offered to thee as to our master. This supplication, have mercy on us. And as you see the priest here standing in front of the icons, in front of the iconostas, that's how every priest does it in the Orthodox Church. Then he continues, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. O Lord, have mercy on us, for indeed have we put our trust. Do not be angry with us, nor remember our iniquities. But look down on us even now, since thou art compassionate, and deliver us from our enemies. For thou art our God, and we are thy people, and we are all the work of thy hands, and we call on thy name. Now, and ever into the ages of ages, amen. Then he turns towards the icon of the third cross. He says, so blessed third cross, open the doors of compassion to us. We hope is indeed that we may not perish, but be delivered from adversity through thee, who are the salvation of the Christian people. He prays to the third cross as the intercessor. Then, right after saying these short prayers, he goes to what we call, during the, this service of taking time, he comes and venerates the icons. So first, on the picture on, on top, you see that he approaches the, the icon of Christ, and uh, along with the deacon, if, if we're talking, if the deacon serves with him. And on the, on the left side, he goes towards the icon of the third cross. So once, first, when he goes towards the icon of Christ, he says this prayer. We venerate the most pure image of good one and ask forgiveness of our transgressions of Christ God. Of thy goodwill, thou was pleased to ascend the cross in the flesh and deliver thy creatures from the bondage of the enemy. Therefore, with thankfulness we cry aloud to thee, thou hast filled all rejoice, Savior, for thou didst come to save the world. And then when he goes towards the icon of the third cross, he bows down, makes a small prostration, like we see in the, in the picture, on the first picture. And then he says the prayer, make us what your mercy of mercy of the cross, fountain of tenderness. Look on us, sinful men, and reveal thy power as always, for we have put our hope in thee. Rejoice, we cry to thee as once gave it's Gabriel, the leader of the bloodless host. After he finishes of venerating the icon of Christ and the third cross, he can also venerate the icon of, uh, let's say, St. John the Baptist, who is usually being put next to Christ on the right side, when you see it from, from, from the perspective of the nows. Or on the left side, you see on the first picture, on the left side, next to the third cross, there is an icon of St. Uh, George, uh, which is probably this temple being dedicated to. So in our case, on the left side, we have the icon of St. Nicholas, because this church is dedicated to the Holy Resurrection of Christ. But if you go to Stilton, where the church is dedicated to St. Nicholas, instead of the, that icon you see there at St. George, you will see the icon of, um, you will see the icon of St. Nicholas, which is usually the saint to whom this temple was being uh, dedicated to. Uh, and of course, on the, if the church is larger, then you have more icons. We'll talk about the creation of the icons and how the iconostas happen to be, uh, which is the icon screen. Uh, the church at the beginning did not have an iconostas. It has only, had only the, uh, the images of Christ and of the third of course. And later on, it started to develop on its own. That's the, the iconostas does not represent the curtain that uh, used to be uh, into the Jewish temple, uh, separating the Holy of Holies from the nows. That's not what, not even the curtain is there. Because if you have, if you can see, every time we serve the divine liturgy, the altar, altar doors are open and the curtain is always removed. Especially if there is a bishop, even before he arrives into the temple, the doors have to be open because the salvation is here. And especially when we serve the divine liturgy, we enter into the kingdom. The reason why we see sometimes the door being closed, especially sometimes even at the beginning of the during, during the divine liturgy, it is because the, the doors have a symbolical representation of the losing of the king of, uh, of the paradise like Adam had. So basically, we who are in the nows, uh, we are the ones when we see the doors closed of the Holy of Holies or the altar, we see... Uh, we, we fall into the same uh, uh, statue, if you will, like Adam had after he was evicted, expelled from the, uh, from, from the paradise. So, but that's something that we're going to talk because I know a lot of our brothers and sisters of the Protestant denominations, they confuse themselves when they see this uh, separation. The iconostas is, has completely different meaning that has nothing to do with that separation that uh, some people uh, might think. So uh, before he, uh, here we see that he kisses the icon of Christ, kisses the icon of the third cross, and then he says the prayers before he enters into the altar. At this time, the priest is not even inside of the altar. This is he coming in front of the, into the church, kissing the icon like we all do when we venerate the icon, which is called the proskinitarium, or the, in the center part of the nows. 
And then when he says taking the, the, the service of taking time, the consecration of time to prepare himself for, the, for entering into the altar and start to vest himself and dress himself and prepare for the divine liturgy, he says these prayers. After kissing the, the regular prayers and kissing the icon, uh, venerating the icon of Christ in the third of the cross, he's standing before the holy doors. The priest bows his head, takes away his hat if needed be, and he says this prayer, or recites this prayer. Lord, stretch forth thy hand from the holy dwelling place on high and strengthen me for this thine unappointed, uh, thine appointed service that standing uncondemned before thine awesome throne, I may offer the bloodless sacrifice. For thine is the power and the glory unto ages of ages. Amen. And the very meaning of this prayer is that the priest is praying to God, to the Holy Spirit, to give him the strength to be able to serve the divine liturgy because it is not the priest who serves, but it is the Christ himself. The priest becomes the visible manifestation or the visible hand or hands of Christ who is going to um, uh, serve the liturgy and then distribute Christ to the people so they can partake of him. So every movement of the priest since the very entrance into the temple, and even before the temple, before when he does his own prayer rule, is covered with prayers. That's uh, what, what happens to all of us. The difference with someone who doesn't serve liturgy, who is a layman, doesn't excuse him of not doing his prayer rule before the day before or in the morning before he comes to church, which we call the canon of Eucharist, that is followed by uh, fasting, even in days when we don't fast. Uh, when, when, because that period of time of eight to six hours, sometimes longer, maybe 10 hours, before we receive the Holy Ghost is taken as a period of fasting. Like when we go to the doctor, when we want to do a blood work and so forth, they say you have to fast, meaning don't eat, don't drink coffee in the morning, and then take and do your blood work. Uh, so that the same uh, fasting is applied when you go. But on a period of fasting, we still don't eat and drink anything in the morning. So after saying this prayer, the priest uh, bows down and, and he uh, goes into the altar. So he says then, uh, they, meaning if there is a deacon service uh, serving, uh, bows down to the people, then enters the sanctuary through the uh, south deacon's door, saying, so just to explain the side, where you see the crucifixion of Christ, the, 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 the direction of the Lord, that's east, back is, of course, west, north is on the left side, and the uh, south is the right side. Usually the priest enters to the south, and only he comes out from the north door. And anyway, and he says this following prayer while he's, after the veneration of the icons, after saying all of the prayers, he says this prayer while he's entering into the altar and bearing and kissing the gospel and kissing the, the holy table while he's, so after he's bowing down, he says, I will enter the house, I will worship towards the holy temple in the fear of thee, lead me, O Lord, in the righteousness because of my enemies. This is all from the Psalms, by the way. Make my way straight before thee, for there is no truth in their mouth, their heart is destruction, their throat is an open sepulcher, they flatter with their tongue, judge them, O God, let them fall by their own counsels, because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against thee, but let all who take refuge in thee rejoice, let them always sing for joy, and do thou dwell in them, that those who love thy name may exalt in thee, for thou blessed the righteous, O Lord, thou coverest us with goodwill as with a shield. Then he priest enters into the uh, into the altar. This is a picture taken from inside of the altar. So he bows down three times before the holy table. Then he kisses the holy gospel, which you see is on top of the, the altar table. Um, uh, of course, he kisses the holy table itself, which represents the tomb of Christ or the throne of Christ, the epimacy of Christ. Uh, and the cross, which is always on the right side. We can't see it over here because it's from the left. But when we see it from the south part, we will see that the cross is on the other side. And then he slowly, uh, after he finishes the narration, bowing down to the, into the altar, he goes towards the diakonikon on the left side, uh, uh, the left side of the priest here, that we don't see it here because we are on the right side from the, from the, from the screen. It's called the diakonikon, where he, uh, the place of dressing, where he goes there and put his robes. He starts with the vesting. So we're going to try to cover that to understand. He also says, oh God, cleanse me a sinner and have mercy on me three times when he does this small prostrations in front of the altar table, kissing the, the, the gospel and the, uh, and, the, and the altar table. Then the priest uh, goes to uh, the, the vesting, uh, in this, putting on the stichari. The stichari you see on the right side here on your screen where you see this priest 
uh, who is uh, putting on. That's uh, the white vestment. It looks like um, like a heaton. Uh, it's put on top. It's always uh, usually 99% uh, of the time it's white, which represents the purity. So this harion is the inner garment that we don't quite see it, but every priest wears it before he serves the liturgy, reaching to the floor. It signifies the purity of heart that should be inseparable from the priestly office. So why why, why is it the purity of heart? What what the, the the fathers are teaching us about the stages of the of the uh, uh, of the spiritual life that we all have to go through. The first stage is what we call the purity of heart, the purification of the heart from all the passions and all the, uh, all the sins. That even though if we fall because of our fallen nature, that doesn't excuse us to not live in repentance and constantly being in a state of repentance in this purity of heart, especially for those who are priests and want to serve in the altar. So, uh, the, the, when, when, when you read St. John Chrysostomus, and I, when I was, uh, before I was ordained, when I was reading St. John Chrysostomus, when he's talking about the, the, the service of the priesthood, I got scared because uh, it, it requires a lot from the spiritual aspect from us. And that's okay. That's what it's important. We need to live a spiritual. So the, this Tiharion, or the, the Hiton, the, uh, this first uh, garment that the priest is putting on him, the white garment, that, as you can see here, it states Christ's purity and illumination as well as the purity and brightness of the holy angels. That is the second stage of the spiritual life. So the first one is the purification of the heart. The second one is the uh, illumination or the, the enlightenment. And the third one, of course, is the theosis. So worn as the undermost vestments by bishop and pre bishops and priests, deacons also wear it, but the deacons have more decorative in, in, in different colors, stiharion. Because uh, we'll talk about how, what, is, what are the special uh, garments for the deacon, for the bishop, and for the priest. For now, we're going to focus on the priest because that's what we see most of the time when we go into the temple, in any Orthodox church. So, worn as the undermost vestments with bishop and priests, it is usually made from a simple white or gold fabric. It's usually white, with maybe can be like you see on the bottom of the stichari, there are little inscriptions that are made from a golden fabric. So, it is worn as an outer vestments. Uh, by deacons and subdeacons, when it is usually more decorated, like we have the altar boys, the, the, the white robes that they wear, those are called stichaios. It is opened down the sides but held shut with bubbles or buttons. Some, jurisdiction, uh, some jurisdictions uh, in, throughout the world, uh, different parts of the Orthodox Church, still call the stichaios, which the deacon wears, a dalmatikon, in accordance with the terminology the universal church used at the time of its introduction in the fourth century. It is also worn as the outer garment by acolytes. It usually has a cross embroidered or applied, uh, uh, applied to the center of the back, that's on the back of the, of the priest, um, which is either maybe embroidered um, um, between the shoulder blades. The following prayer is said when they say, every priest, every bishop, every deacon, and including the altar boys, when they're dressing themselves for this, the priests, uh, they uh, uh, put the sign of the cross, they uh, kiss the, the cross on the back of these vestments, and they, while they're putting, while they're vesting themselves, they say the prayers, my soul shall exalt the Lord in the Lord, for he has endued me with the robe of salvation and with the garment of joy has he clothed me. He has set a crown on my head like a bridegroom, and like a bride he has adorned me with humbleness. This is from uh, chapter 61, verse 10 from the book of prophet Isaiah. So, Everything is done with prayer. Everything is done covered with prayer. So then the priest, after he puts the garment, you see on his sleeves, he, uh, he makes it, um, uh, he, he covers them um, uh, with, with this little uh, rope that he has. Then he puts the second garment, which called the epitrahelion, or the soul, meaning the, on the neck. That's the literal uh, meaning. Signifies the outpouring of grace from above on the priest. It, it, it's the representation, is the manifestation of, of the ordination of the priest by the apostles, by, by the bishops of Hutz, who are the successors the, of the apostles. So that's why the, the Petrahelion is one of the most common garment that every priest wears, even for outside of the liturgy services, like when he performs baptisms, or when he anoints people, when he does the holy confession, and so forth. It also symbolizes the cross carried by our Lord upon his shoulders. 
also represents not just the cross, also represents the lamb that um, Christ says in the parable, the good shepherd uh, left the 99 sheep and he went for one, uh, one lap, one sheep to uh, the lost sheep to find it and put it back. That's the omophorion, which represents what the bishop was. That's a different garment and we're gonna talk about it in different, uh, uh, different class, different, uh, different time. A church service cannot be celebrated without them. It denotes the balance, weight, and responsibility that priests have for all our souls. God has the responsibility, but the priests are there who, who are ordained by, by, by the church, by God, by the Holy Spirit, to be the wise and the good shepherds of their flock. So the tassels that hang out at the lower part of the stall, which unfortunately I don't have the icon here to see it. Let me see. I'll, I'll show it to you later. Um, uh, uh, represents our souls that hang on the spiritual uh, 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 father's neck. Let me see here. Um, I'll try to find, no, we can't find it here, but um, those are little, the, 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 many of the petrahelions or the, the souls are made like that. So even the garments itself have a symbolic meaning. And every time when the priest uh, kisses the petrahelion, he puts it on his shoulders, uh, he says the following prayer that comes from Psalm 133, verse 2. Blessed is God who pours his grace on his priests like the balm on the head, the drown down the beard, even Aaron's beard down to the skirts of his garment. This is the prayer uh, that if, uh, every time when we put the, uh, 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 the epitrahelia. Then comes the zone or the belt, which is the third garment that the priest puts on him after he has put the stichadion and the epitrahelia or the, the stiharion and the soul. So the zone is worn over the stiharion and epitrichion. This is what it looks like. It's basically the belt. It has a cross on it usually. It doesn't have to have, but it usually has. This girding shows a priest's readiness for service and the strength he receives from the Holy Spirit to succeed in his mission, in his liturgical action that he's going to perform. So he's dressing himself with blessings the whole time. So the zone, uh, when he puts it on his own, he always says the prayer, blessed is God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He made my feet like his feet and set me secure on the heights. This is from Psalm 1733 from 2 Samuel 2234 and uh, or Habakkuk, uh, the prophet, uh, chapter 3, verse 19. So after the third garment, he puts the epimanikia or the in, in, in Serbian, we call it narukvice or, or the cuffs, where uh, basically there are two. He first puts on the right hand and then on the left hand. So the epimanik, epimanikia, the two pieces cuffs symbolize God's creative hands and his omnipotence. The cords which tie them, which uh, while he is putting, you'll see on the, on, the, on the second picture, there is a cord that uh, goes around it to tie the, the, the cuffs, represents the rope which with which the Lord was tied. Putting on the first epimanikia, right cuff, this prayer is said. Every priest says the following prayer from the book of Exodus 15, 67. Thy right hand, O Lord, has been glorified in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has shattered thine enemies. In the greatness of the majesty, Dove has overthrown thine adversaries. Then he goes with the left cuff of the left epimanikia. Uh, which he says the prayers, thy hands have made me and fashioned me, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. This is from Psalm 118, uh, verse 73. So uh, uh, after he has put the stichadion, the, the stole or the petrahelion, the zoni or the belt and the, the cuffs, uh, the priest puts the felonium, that's the upper garment that you see. Of course, we see now a priest who has a golden or yellow vestments. Also, the color of the vestments are important. Usually, uh, when we have uh, during the Great Lent, for example, if you probably notice, the priests wear purple uh, garments. When during the uh, during or when, when sometimes um, um, it's required, to. Uh, red is usually wearing during the, the holidays of martyrs because it represents blood. It also has other symbolic meanings during Christmas and so forth. Green is usually wearing uh, green vestments when it's uh, a holiday like the dedicated to the Holy Spirit. So for example, on the day of the Pentecost and the whole period of Pentecost. On the uh, feasts that are dedicated to the Theta Cross or let's say the Transfiguration and so forth, like during the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the season of the, the summer uh, Lent, 
He wears blue garments. So every color also has a spe special meaning, but the main theme is the white one because it represents the resurrection of our Lord. So the, uh, the Philonian signifies the crimson robe which, uh, with which the soldiers clotted, uh, clothed our Lord Jesus to mock him while he was in the praetorium. And this is the prayer that we says, Thy priests, O Lord, shall clothe themselves with righteousness, and thy saints shall rejoice with joy always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. This is from Psalm 131, verse 9. Preparing to wear each of the parts of these vestments, the priest blesses them with the sign of the cross and kisses them. So in order to show you, it's just depicts the, the sign of the cross, as we say, which represents Christ, uh, uh, Jesus, which means Jesus. The X represents the Christ. And Mika, or N, represents the victor that he blesses, he kisses the cross, and then he puts them on and saying all of these prayers that are excerpts from the Psalms or from the book of Exodus or from the prophet Isaiah. After he has finished dressing himself, so he has so far put the stiharion, which is the, the first, the white garment that we talk. He has put the epitrahelion, which is the, the stole. Then he puts the zoni or the belt, and he puts the right cuff, the left cuff. He puts the felonium, then he is ready to uh, prepare himself with the service of the proscomidi. So what he does is he approaches uh, towards the uh, place where the, the water is being held. Many churches have installed uh, their own springs of water inside of them so they can use them. But uh, for example, in our parish, we have our own, we, we fill it with water and we have a special place, a bowl in which we use and we dispose the water into the third in the flowers. So he, then he washes his hands to signify his cleanliness, praying according, this is of course, uh, according to the custom of, of, uh, of the Jewish temple, that the priests, before they would uh, perform any of the, uh, the sacrificial offerings, they would wash their hands. This does not, does not have just a symbolical metaphorical meaning uh, to uh, physically manifest the inner uh, uh, um, purity, but rather also has a hygienic purposes. A lot of people that, uh, in the past, they didn't know that there were microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, and whatnot, that they existed and they could kill you. Uh, we know that in many times when the plague happened, uh, the Jewish uh, societies always survived because as part of their ritual was the washing of the hands. And, and um, um, uh, this is something of common practice. In when we see the serving of, the, of a bishop during the hierarchical divine liturgy, you will see the bishop sometimes he washes the hands in the middle of the liturgy. But that's because that's the time when the bishop performs the, the service of the proscomity. So before even he starts, he first washes his hands in front of everyone, and then he goes back into the altar. This happens usually during the cherubic song. And then he starts with the uh, the proscomidi and follow uh, and finishes the liturgy. While he's washing his hands, he recites Psalm 26, for, uh, 26 verse 6. I wash hands in <clears throat> innocence and go about then all the Lord, singing a lot of song of praise and telling of all the miracles of the Lord. I love the beauty of the house and the place where the glory dwells. This is the prayer that he says uh, while he's washing his hands. Vested in completing the proscomidi, the priest is prepared to begin, begin to do the liturgy. So this is the what we call the proscomedia. Of course, this is just a general picture uh, that I found so you can have a visual representation of what, uh, of what, it, what it is. So let me explain you first what we see in front of us. We see, first of all, uh, the chalice and the discus, the plate. The chalice is where uh, the priests, of course, we're later on gonna use to give Holy Communion. And uh, the discus is the place, the plate where uh, the Holy Bread will be put. Of course, this is uh, in the in the midst, in the middle of the proscomity. It's not finished. We'll, we'll see some pictures later. Where the priests, after he's washed his hands, he comes over. And on the left corner here, you, say, you, see, you have something like we call, you know, like in this picture now, the prosphora. That's the special bread that is being prepared prior to this and brought into the church where the priest uses to uh, serve the proscomity that will become the body of Christ. And this uh, uh, this uh, bread, the 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 the, the prosphora, as we call it, is prepared in a special way. We uh, I don't know if uh, remember we I've told you that when Presbytera comes back, uh, she will 
uh, make sure that uh, one, one, once she comes in in August, uh, we're going to have like a little uh, class where you all together can come along and you can learn how to make the prosphora. We'll, we'll give you the seal so you can make prosphora at home. The usual practice of the church was for the people to bring, that's why it's called prosphora, the offering. People would bring wine, would bring bread that is prepared for the Holy Communion. And that's why uh, the proskomidi uh, is the offering, not of the priest, but of, from the whole parish, from everyone who is here. And the way it's being prepared is we say certain prayers, we light some incense, we bake, but prior to bake, it takes a, a, a process of, of how it's done. Uh, there is a, the regular process, the canonical way, which requires almost two days to make it. And there's this fast because now we have fast uh, rising yeast and so forth. So sometimes when it makes to, uh, we need, need to make it, it takes a shorter period of time to do. But this bread, the prosphora, uh, is, the, is the bread that has the special seal on top of it. And this is the, uh, let me see, oh, here it is. Here on the left side, on the right side, you can see that the prosphora is as it's baked, as it's done. On the left side is the seal with an inverse picture because it will be imprinted into the dough when it's being prepared for the, uh, uh, for the bread to be baked. And we will do this so you can see it with your own eyes how it's being done. And of course, if you like, you can make, and it will be, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blessed offering that any family can, can do. I noticed, so for example, on the left side here, the Russian practice is very interesting. Um, every family makes this little prosphorus with the seal, and they usually, when they come to church on Sunday, they give it to the priest. The priest has a bigger bread, bigger prosphora to offer that is being done by other people. But uh, every family can bring little prosphoras. So the priest can take a small particles from that when later when we talk about the prosphora, to take the names, remember the names of that family that came uh, to give the offering. So basically, uh, this is done by the whole community of the church. It's not the service of the priest who only the priest serves and not. No, everybody participates in the church by um, offering themselves into the service of the Lord. And what we give to the Lord, the best of the best. We give the first fruits of the Lord. As Christ commanded us, do this in my honor, in my name, uh, the bread and the wine. We put the bread and the wine and then... Uh, during the liturgy, they will become the body and blood of Christ. We'll talk about this in more depth uh, in the future, so we can cover all of the uh, the aspects of it, the, the, the deep, the symbolical, the deep theological meaning behind behind all of that. But for now, we just want to superficially cover the the the, the process. So anyway, this on the left side, you see, there's like a little square that that was taken out of the the process. That's another thing that I promised you, God willing. We can do. You can see how the priest is doing the cutting of the bread, uh, how and what kind of prayers does he says during the proskomidi. So you can see that everything, even the movement of the knife, the movement of the of, this, of the uh, of the discus and the chalice and the pouring of the wine and everything that is being prepared is done in a way that is done in prayer. And uh, later on, of course, we'll talk more extensively about this because we'll not be able to cover everything uh, today. So. The priest, fully vested, proceeds to the table of preparation called the prothesis or of proskomini, the offering of the, of the proskomini. The prothesis table is always located inside the sanctuary and usually on the wall to the left of the altar table, north part, on the north part, where the priest dressed himself. The, where is the diakonikon? There is the proskomini usually. So the proskomini is the preparation of the holy gifts, the bread, the wine, for the divine liturgy. The prothesis, uh, prothesis depicts the birthplace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the many symbolical allegories, if you will, uh, that what, what it represents. Uh, but many of the fathers, they try not to use theatrical, symbolical, uh, especially like, let's say, the prothesis is the birth of Christ, and the small interest is the preaching of the gospel, then the great interest is the, his path towards Golgotha, and so forth, but rather because it's not a theater, it's, it's, it's a liturgy. It's, it has a completely different meaning. And we spoke about this, we talked about this uh, last Tuesday. But then uh, the prothesis, uh, uh, the priest uses a lens uh, that uh, um, we, we cannot see it now, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in depth. I just want to show you how we're going to uh, cover all of this. Uh, signifying the lens used to be uh, guard 
to pierce our Lord's side when on the cross, cuts the center square of the prosphorum bread. This is the center square here in the middle of the, um, uh, where it says, Jesus Christos Nica, uh, or oblation loaf, and recites the prophet Isaiah the words, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shear is done. So he opens, so he cuts one part. Then he says, he opens not his mouth, he cuts the other part. In his humiliation, justice was denied to him. Then goes on top of it. And then he says, who shall declare his generation for his life is raised from the earth. And he cuts the bottom and he raises this uh, cube here that we see on the left side, this pieces of bread from the prosper. So if the prosper is the whole bread like this, it looks like a circle. He only takes the central part in depth like this. And he says, all of this prayer. He quotes a prophet Isaiah. First he says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shear is done. He opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who shall declare his, gener uh, his generation? And then after he finishes, he says, while he's raising the bread, the, the, uh, what's called the lamb, that's the central part, it's called the lamb or the agnets. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Uh, uh, for his life is raised from the, from the earth. This is the resurrection of Christ. So the priest elevates the prosphon or oblation loaf to commence the proskomidi. In his right hand, he holds the lens. He does this with a lens, or sometimes some priests use a knife, but lens is the appropriate way. So you have the chalice, on the left side you have the discus, you have the star, that's the little thing that uh, fortunately we can't see it now here, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in depth. You have the spear or the lens, and we have the the, the, the spoon that's later being used for to give Holy Communion to people. And we have the coverings for, especially for the discus or the, or the, the plate, it's for the, for the chalice. And we have a general uh, covering, which is called the air. That's the thing when the priest, when he says, the doors, the doors and wisdom, let us attend. And he raises the air and he does this with it. He, he uh, shakes the air, which basically um, is the covering that covers both the, the discus and the, the chalice. So after saying these prayers, he, he moves on to serving the, 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 the proskomidi. So uh, the, when it comes to the prosphora, just to, to explain what it is and what is the, the meaning of, just to focus on that a little bit, a religious holy bread seals, fragida, or means the seal, stamps a special design on the prosphora before baking. Uh, so this is the sfragida on the left side. This is a wooden or sometimes can be made out of different material, but it's usually wooden that has this inverse um, carving inside of it that while before the bread is being put to be baked, the, 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 whoever is making the, the, the prosola, he imprints, he seals the bread with it and lets, lets it, uh, leaves it break, uh, baking it like that. And this is every household in the Orthodox Church has those seal so when they want to make a prosphora to give it to the church as an offering they would um, um, they would use it uh, for this and we'll, we'll talk about uh, this a little bit more so during the preparation of the eucharist the priest conducts the proscomedy in which he first cuts out the center of the standard design that says Jesus Christos Nica Jesus Christ the conqueror this is that middle part that I just mentioned to you it becomes the body of Christ, the lamb. That's the, what we call it. That's the lamb, not the other part. The other parts will also be there, but we'll talk about it. Then the large triangle on the left is cut in honor of the Virgin Mary. That's here on the left side here. It looks like a triangle that uh, visibly very much, but <clears throat> um, uh, the nine small triangles that you see here on the right, right from Christ, from, right from the limb, um, uh, are cut to commemorate the angels, the prophets, apostles, holy fathers, prelates, martyrs, ascetics, holy and mercenaries, Joachim and Anna, and all saints, including the saint of the day's liturgy. For example, today we celebrated Prince Lazarus. So we took one small triangle, little one, that was given in his honor. So uh, the last cuts are tiny uh, squares to remember specific names of the living and the dead. The first priest takes this, it separates the this on the top, there are four. The one first, uh, the priest takes it, it's in the honor of the bishop. The other one is for the whole Orthodox uh, people around the world. In the ancient tradition of the Orthodox Church, holy mystery of communion is carried out through the mediums of wine and leavened bread. The bread is specially baked for the purpose of communion, and it's called prosphora, meaning that 
which is offered, or the offering. Kosfer is made from only four ingredients, wheat flour, white, usually white, yeast, salt, and water. So we don't put oil, we don't put any, any other ingredients, only those four ingredients, flour, yeast, salt, and water. Salt was not used in early times when, and not now in the Jerusalem Patriarchate Church. Uh, why? Because they have a special way of preserving the, the, the bread of corruption with previously prepared yeast that doesn't require of using salt, but it's completely normal, especially now that you use salt. So you see the Patriarch of Jerusalem, they still don't use salt as it was in the time of the apostles. Anyway, any uh, member of the church who is in good standing and whose conscience is clean may beg bake prosphora. That's why I've said we, when we're going to talk about making the prosphora, it doesn't require only uh, cooking skills, which is okay to have, but it also requires the ability to pray and to know how to make the prosphora being spiritually prepared for. Often in the parish church, the women will take the, the women will take the turns baking the prosphora in monasteries. The task is often assigned by the igumen or the abbot or the abbess of the monastery to one or several monastics of virtuous life. So not everybody should make the prosphora, but those people who will take that as an obedience to make it the right way. So this is the prosper that look well, from, from the top when you see it. So you see there are three seals. The middle one is the what we call the lamb, where it says, Jesus Christos Nika. This is in Greek, which means Jesus Christ the conqueror. On top of it is the same, so they're a little bit smaller on, top, on the top and on the bottom. And they're used, the top is used to, from which the priest later on during the service will take the, uh, the particles to remember the living members of the parish, for example, that he has from the book of Dittichon. And the, the bottom is being used to remember the departed. On the left side, you see the triangle that is always offered to the most holy Theotokos, as in the psalm says that she sits on the right sense, uh, on the right side as the bride. She is, the, uh, is given in her honor. And on the right side, you have the nine small triangles, which represents, as we said, uh, the first one is dedicated to the, to the angels, the second one to the prophets, the third one to the apostles, the fourth one to the hierarchs of the church, the, the, you know, the, the fifth one is dedicated to the, um, uh, to the, uh, all the martyrs, the great martyrs, the martyrs, men and women martyrs of the church. The sixth one is given to the venerable fathers and mothers. The um, seventh is given to the unmercenaries, Cosmo Damianus, and many of those. Uh, the, 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 then the, the eighth one is given to the Joachim and Nana, which are the parents of the most holy Theotokos, but also we commemorate the saint of the day, like today, Prince Lazarus. And the last one is given to St. John Chrysostomos or St. Basil the Great or St. James, depending which liturgy we're going to serve. These other small triangles between, let's say, the Theotokos and the, uh, the lower uh, lamb, the lower and, and above and all and the four, those are only given for the uh, the bishop, that's to remember the, the, the name of the bishop and to remember the, um, uh, remember the, uh, the people in general. So uh, in a, in it's common, but not necessary to go to confession before baking prosphora. It is often done in the morning while fasting. Sometimes special kitchen implements are used for making the prosphora, which are used for no other purposes. There may be a special prayer set before commencing and baker tries to maintain a religious state of mind throughout, often saying the Jesus prayer, which is Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me a sinner. Or we can say our father, we can say the Psalm 50, whatever. But while we're making the prosvara, we are constantly praying. Or we can sing Christ is risen from the dead. So, so um, usually enough prosvara for a number of services are baked at the same time. But because what we do with the bread that is not being used for that day or the next day, we can freeze them and use them later uh, throughout the month. Prosphora is made out of two separate round pieces of leavened dough, which are placed on top or, or, of another and baked together to form a single loaf. This double loaf represents the two natures of Christ, human and divine. Before baking, um, each prosphoron, prosphoron is stamped with a seal, usually bearing the image of a cross with the Greek letters, Jesus Christos Nika, Jesus Christ the conquer, con conquers around the arms of the cross. The impression is baked into the bread and serves as guide for the priest who will be cutting it. That's why the priest serves this only when he does it. And even, let's say, in a certain, certain circumstances, when the priest, uh, let's say, uh, the prosphora was not made well, or he couldn't find a prosphora, and he has to serve with a regular bread that has yeast, he himself, according to the account, can make the sign of all you can see here on top of the bread and use that as a guideline to make 
and cut the prosera. That's like an extreme uh, situation when there is not possibility to make the prosera. So in our parish, we have several people who are making the prosera, including my, my wife. Before we make the prosphora, we uh, light up a little bit of incense and we start saying we're reading the Akatistos or we read some certain prayers and we uh, make the dough. And, 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 I, and we will do this all together so you can all learn uh, how it's done. This is the prothesis. So in its present form, the prothesis probably dates from the 14th century, the way it is we're seeing it now. But when a bishop is celebrating the divine liturgy, the prothesis is performed just before the offer uh, offertory procession called the great entrance because the bishop when he comes to serve the, the, he comes to serve basically the the canon of the eucharist those prayers that we read before that and we'll talk about is the antiphons and all that there were uh, prayers that were uh, sung into the church as a preparation leading into the entrance of the canon of the eucharist or while they were waiting the bishops or the apostles to come and and perform the, the holy eucharist otherwise it is done before the beginning of the liturgy of the world uh, of, of the um, the first part of the liturgy. At the prothesis, the priest first cuts a large cube of bread from the loaf of bread traditionally called the prosper, which means the offering or the lamb. This cube of bread is called the lamb. It stands for Christ, the bread of life, which came down from heaven, the lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is in John 3, 24, John 6, 32, and, and 15. But you see here on the left side, he puts that triangle that we saw here on the left side. And on the right side, he puts those Nine. This is not very well cut, but this is on the bottom. You see all these crumbs. They represent the living and the dead. And for each crumb that he puts on the on the discus on the plate, he remembers a name in a prayerful notion. So first he remembers the living, and he remembers the departed, and then he takes from the uh, one particle only for him. So this is maybe better cut. You see, it is presence from the prothesis probably, as we said, uh, this is just repetition of the text. Uh, this is a very old way of doing it, but the, the form that we have today probably comes from the 13th and from the 14th century, but in the same way it was served from the first century. This is how it was done for centuries, since the beginning of the church. Just the way, like you see, for example, this seal is different than this seal. They, they resemble the same thing. It's just different traditions from different parts of the world, uh, of the world where, where Orthodox live uh, and, and serve give different, um, uh, just a little different shape, different form, but the meaning is the same, of course. So anyway, uh, this is all for, for now that I, I wanted to uh, share with you regarding the, 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 the dressing of the priest or the vesting of the priest and, and how he is preparing first for the keros, for the serving of the, of the liturgy, then, then doing the prosphora, and then of course, Moving on with the with doing the pros committee. Of course, the pros committee requires a special attention because we're going to cover serving the pros committee, the, the service on its own. But um, for now, I think it's sufficient to just cover um, this, uh, so we can uh, then move on with the book of Father Thomas Hope and then uh, go from there. So after the reading of the prayers, uh, uh, we see that. Uh, when, when the priest is cutting the bread, which is, uh, let's see if we can zoom in here a little bit more. He says the prayer, uh, he was led as a lamb to us to the slaughter, the wine and the water poured into the chalice after saying certain prayers. So we're, we're going to talk about all of this in God willing next uh, time. You see how the priest is doing each and every part of the preparation for the post committee. And God willing, maybe one day we can do the post committee service outside of the altar so you can all see what's going on. What prayers do we, we do, and what is the the regular routine that we do every um, uh, every time when we serve uh, the divine liturgy? Something that uh, I think it will be good for you to know, just to uh, to understand uh, better the, the the procedure of what's going on. Of course, we're going to try to talk about the meaning behind all of those things uh, behind the prosphora, behind the, the the bread and the wine. Why do we say those prayers and so forth? So we'll try to cover all that. Okay, guys. So for now, that's that's all that I have prepared. God willing, we will um, try to uh, talk a little bit more next Tuesday uh, when it comes to the, our, uh, our, our when it comes to our Bible studies. Uh, uh, waiting for Father Matthew to say whether he's going to uh, uh, lead the Bible studies tomorrow, or we'll continue with how to, which is I think if you remember. We stopped um, 
about that. So we're going to maybe answer some of the questions that uh, a few weeks ago we, 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 we talked about. So we, we'll continue with that. Um, okay, uh, yeah, go ahead, Joe, you had a question, go for it. Uh, Michael is uh, asking if you're going to be doing Vespers this coming Saturday. Yes, yes, there will be always Vespers on, on, on Saturday. We almost never change. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, the Vespers is always from, uh, uh, from six. We have Friday, uh, we, have, we had liturgy this morning. Today was, today is a, it's like a Serbian holiday because uh, uh, we honor today's, today's uh, day's Vidovdan or the day on the Battle of Kosovo where the Serbian people, the Serbian army faced the much, much larger enemy, the Ottoman Empire. And in order to defend Serbia from, um, and the Serbian people from the invasion of the Ottomans and, and uh, the Muslims, they uh, decided to die in the battle and um, 14,000 people died today. So uh, today is the day when we celebrate, remember them. And the leader of that army was Prince Lazar, King Lazar, some people call him, who uh, with his whole army, he went in the morning in the church, received, did, did confession. They all received Holy Communion and they went into battle knowing that they're going to die. Like I said, they would rather die than, uh, than bow down to the, to the Muslims. Uh, so. Today we serve liturgy from nine. We have parakesis on, on Friday evening from 6.30 as usual. And we have, of course, Saturday uh, Vespers. Uh, why do the angels uh, get a piece of the proscomedia prosphera? It is, they don't get anything. That's not about someone getting something, Scott. It's more about the commemoration, the, those little pieces of bread that we give. It's more of a um, an offering that we do to ask for their intercessions. They resemble the angels, the, 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 the apostles, the prophets, the, everyone who is remember, remembered, they represent the fullness of the church, that the church is not just one or two people. It's not just a certain uh, category of, of members of the church, but the whole church, not just the, the living who are here present while we are serving the liturgy, but also the, the, the departed, and we take particles from them for them as well. That also includes the angels, because the angels are also created um, uh, beings like everyone else is. They're not gods, so that's why they, they are being taken. Um, yes, uh, and, and the angels are our intercessors, because it, when we get baptized, each one of us gets an angel guardian. But uh, the angels become our close, let's say, uh, intercessors in front of God in the church. In the church, we, we have two parts. The one part is what we call the visible church, the priests, the icons, the, the brothers and sisters, who are the children who are in the church, the bricks, the, the, maybe the, the, the chanting we can hear, the, the smelling of the incense. But the, the, the most important part of the church is what we call the invisible to the biological eyes church, which is the the presence of the Holy Spirit every liturgy, even though it's invisible to us. And um, uh, something that uh, reminds us, for example, uh, in the Old Testament, when Elijah, uh, walking with his um, disciple or his uh, uh, spiritual child, Elisha, prophet uh, Eliseus, he, he saw something, but Eliseus couldn't see anything, Prophet Elisha. So he said, what do you see? So he asked God to remove the veil of his eyes to see the, the spiritual reality, the, 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 what we call the invisible church outside of the, the natural uh, environment that they were finding themselves in. When Elisha saw, he was in awe. When, when, uh, but um, that was before uh, Elijah ascends in the, the fiery chariot and, and ascends into heaven. So... Uh, that same thing happens to us in the liturgy because when, while we're in the liturgy, even though visibly it looks like the priest is serving the liturgy, it looks like we are the ones who are only there. Amongst us is the whole realm of a spiritual uh, reality that uh, the reason why we can't see it is because of our blindness or uh, for the reasons that not, can, we cannot always understand uh, why God is hiding that from us. But one day we will all see it. So that's why the liturgy, when it's offered, it's so important because even the angels are becoming the participants, the co-service, the co-celebrants of the divine liturgy. They constantly live in a state of, of doxology, in a state of uh, liturgy. 
because the divine liturgy is not just a form of um, official uh, functioning of the church in a, in a celebrated form, like, like doxology or maybe glorification or uh, thanksgiving and, and asking, but it's sort of a com combination of all of them put together. So that's why the highest form of prayer that the humankind offers is the one that Christ gave us, not just through the words our Father, but rather with the divine liturgy, which becomes the mysterium. It becomes uh, uh, the, the presence of the kingdom of heaven and earth. And that's why the liturgy starts with the words, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that includes into this uh, as an integral part of the kingdom of heaven, not just the spiritual realm, but us also. Even those who are still alive and those who have departed or died uh, longer, much, much longer than, uh, than our close relatives and so forth. So, okay, um, that will be all for today. We'll, we'll record this. Uh, this is recorded session. So God willing, we'll uh, publish on our YouTube uh, channel and of course on our, our patrons um, channel. So you can uh, see it over there. Of course, if you have any questions on, on our Patreon channel, I also publish the, all of our, I'll try to publish all of our um, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations for the PDF files and so forth. So tomorrow, God willing, uh, we will, um, uh, have the Bible studies, if in case Father Matthew is not able to attend and lead the Bible studies, we'll then move on with the topic that we uh, uh, we had to stop because we didn't have enough time, which is how to the orthodox um, uh, catechism, or actually orthodox explanation, the practical questions and answers regarding uh, several aspects. We talked about uh, why the women wear scarves, we talked about um, how the people, the men and women are divided into the church on the left and right side. We talk, why do we have iconostas? We talked about some very things that people usually ask and they, they need a, the, the proper answer in order to understand. We talked about what is a prayer rule? How do we pray? What is a prayer rule? So we will try to cover all of that, uh, God willing, the following tomorrow and in the following uh, Wednesdays. But if Father Matthew is uh, here tomorrow, then we'll, we'll go with him and we'll do that some other time. Okay, um, if there are no questions, then God willing, we can, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to, uh, we'll try to cover everything we need to uh, cover. Let's say the prayers, and as I said, we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow, and of course, next Tuesday, we'll continue with this uh, catechism process as usual. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.